morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to today's CEO Forum on mainstreaming sustainability in the manufacturing sector using a principle-based approach. My name is Susan Giroge. I am an independent consultant on sustainability and communications, and it is my honor and pleasure to be your moderator for this event. Thank you to everyone who's already uh, sharing where they're from. Great, we've got people from Cape Town, South Africa. Hello, we've got um, someone from near Fiber here in Nairobi. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Family Bank as well. Ashmi from LG Harris. Please feel free to say hello on the chat. Um, we would very much like to, to hear from you and know where, where you're from. Um, just before we begin, a couple of um, quick housekeeping rules for you. We will run a couple of polls, uh, three polls actually during this session. We'd really welcome you to please give us your feedback um, on the poll sessions and, and tell us what you think. Um, and as you've obviously noticed, um, you are on video and audio mute as the audience. So please feel free to share your comments, your feedback, your questions using the chat function and the Q&A um, section as well. Okay, so let's kick off. Um, today, we're here to really discuss um, the role of uh, manufacturing sector for this country. And as you know, manufacturing has a critical role to play in Kenya's development plan as part of the big four and vision 2030. So I think it's timely and very relevant that we're having this conversation, that we're engaging with the CEOs that we will have in the panel to ask the questions, what is the role of manufacturing when we look at Kenya's development? What, what is their role in terms of ensuring that we reach that vision of 2030, which is actually in the next uh, nine to 10 years? So to kick us off, please uh, welcome uh, the CEO of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, Phyllis Wakiaga. Phyllis, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning and to welcome you for this CEO's forum we're having, uh, the first one between uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers and the Global Compact Network Kenya, where we are looking at mainstreaming sustainability in the manufacturing sector. So thank you for joining us. So Dame Jane, an English uh, anthropologist said that you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So today's forum is seeking to provide local industries with opportunities to make a positive impact on the world. This is by shedding light on ways that our members and manufacturers can create long-term value for your businesses while creating a more sustainable and inclusive path to economic growth, prosperity, and well-being. So thank you for uh, joining us for this today. And I know this is a first of many sessions we're going to have going forward. So allow me to recognize uh, the guests that have joined us uh, for this session today. We have with us Melvin Marsh, international founder and CEO, Flora Mtai, uh, who is the current chair of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, a board member also at the UN Global Compact, uh, the global board and also the local board, and a former chair of KAM. So Karibu Sana Flora. We also have uh, the Sassini Managing Director and CEO, Martin Ochien, joining us today. Thank you very much. We have Rebecca Mbivi from Family Bank, the CEO of Family Bank uh, here with us today. And we also have Judy Gino, who is the Global Compact Network Kenya Executive Director. Asante Sana, thank you all of you for joining us. And our members, I want to recognize you and also any guests who have joined. So the manufacturing sector, I think, has been a critical sector for economic growth in our country. And we play a big role in driving job, job creation and wealth creation in the country. And COVID-19 has demonstrated the need for an even more resilient manufacturing sector that can support economic growth 
even when we are hardest hit by a pandemic such as this. Such as this. At the same time, we must be cognizant that Kenya is also deindustrializing, which is demonstrated by the decreasing contribution to the GDP of the manufacturing sector. So even as we advocate for government to put in place policies that seek to reverse this trend, we must also acknowledge that our competitiveness is also dependent on sustainable industrial development. We need to ask ourselves, what must we do so that we don't compromise our ability to meet the needs of future generations, even as we try and grow our industry and attain the current needs of today. So sustainability has many benefits, and I know the panelists will be speaking to that, but businesses can make great strides by embracing sustainability in their operations, and they can embed sustainability in their strategic plans and craft objectives to fit the vision in order for them to meet these plans. And there are numerous reasons why as manufacturers, we need to pursue sustainability in our day-to-day -day operations. It increases our operational efficiency, and I think that has been experienced by a number of us because we are able to reduce cost and waste. It also strengthens our brand identity in the market. A strong long-term business viability and success is also linked to sustainability being entrenched within our businesses. And adherence to regulatory requirements is also critical because it helps us take advantage of opportunities that exist. So as the association, we acknowledge the role of sustainable manufacturing practices, not only to industry and citizens, but to the economy at large. And to this end, we will continue to partner with like-minded stakeholders and our members to support initiatives that promote sustainability practices in Kenya and in the manufacturing sector. Some of the other initiatives we've taken up include the work we do uh, with you around energy and water efficiency, green financing, waste management, the women in manufacturing work, the climate change mitigation work that we do. So today we take another step uh, towards driving sustainable practices and we want to work with you to adopt a principle-based approach which is good for your businesses. Thanks to a value system, the principle-based approach of doing business allows business to adopt operating standards that meet fundamental responsibilities in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And this is in line with the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact that we'll be hearing more about today. We have a panel of great speakers who will demonstrate to us the benefits of this approach and also showcase some of the good practices that they've been able to put in place to make this a success. So I welcome all of you to, uh, to this session and I look forward to the interactions out of this. Thank you so much. Phyllis, thank you for your remarks and insight. Um, that was very, uh, very great in terms of setting the context. Um, we're always having the conversations and a lot of people are hearing about sustainable development and always potentially wondering, you know, and I've heard it in conversation myself a lot, what is this sustainable development? This is not something that's really for our context here in Kenya. It's, a, it's an issue for developed countries. But I think just to set context, uh, sustainable development is really about how we're developing as a country today without putting into risk or detriment the opportunity for future generations to continue providing and supporting themselves with what they will need for the future. So it's important that we're able to bring home this conversation to our own industry and to our own context. And a, you know, a sector like manufacturing that is so critical to how Kenya will grow as a country for the future. I think it's very timely that you know, CAM and Global Compact Network Kenya having this conversation because it's something that we, we really need to look at when we're talking about development for our nation. And so um, I'll bridge that into our uh, panel discussion now. Uh, Phyllis uh, introduced and welcomed our guests. And so now I'll invite um, our panelists to join us. We have Flora Mutahi, who you see already on screen, the new chair of KEPSA. Congratulations on your appointment. Flora is also a Global Compact board member at an international level. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you here. We have Martin Ochien, who's the CEO and MD of uh, Stasini who are one of the leading tea and coffee producers in the country. 
um, we have Rebecca Mbithi, who's the CEO and, and MD, sorry, of Family Bank. Um, we also have Judy Njinu, who's the executive director of the Global Compact Network Kenya. The idea of this panel conversation is to really have a conversation with, with the influencers in the manufacturing sector to ask them what's the scene, what is happening around um, embedding sustainability within that sector. And Martin, if you'll allow me to kick off with you first. So business today is operating in really uncertain times, um, be it COVID, be it the significant economic downturn. As a company in the tea and coffee industry or in ag agriculture, this is, this is also potentially really true for you. And, you know, realities of climate change, et cetera, are, are sensing uncertain times coming for the future. Yet you embed sustainability and taking those sustainability decisions for the long term can be a challenge, especially in these times. How are you defending the choices that you're making around sustainability commitment? So good morning, Simon, and uh, thank you very much to you uh, for ably hosting us, uh, to my co-panelists, and uh, I guess to all the members and uh, the people on the call, uh, welcome, and uh, we pray that uh, the discussions we'll have today <coughs> um, will be fruitful, not just for the panelists, but uh, also for the members. I, I must also say, before I answer those, uh, that question, that uh, it's a bit of a character building moment for me. Uh, it's getting to be something of a, of a common uh, occurrence to you know, be a male voice in a, in, in a strong panel like this that has uh, you know, very strong ladies with very good opinions. I work with a lot of the uh, people on the panels and uh, I feel welcome. I feel part, uh, part and parcel of, of the group. So thank you very much for having me. Um, so Sassini's business, uh, and maybe before, you know, I give a brief of uh, why sustainability, especially in the midst of what we've been going through in the last 15, 16 months. Sassini's business is a you know, 70 year old enterprise. Kenya's biggest agricultural business. Uh, as Susan has intimated, uh, we are growers, uh, producers, packers, marketers, and exporters of uh, you know, the biggest crops in the country, tea, coffee, macadamia, and avocado. And we do that in large scale, mainly to Europe and to North America, and lately to the Far East in Japan and South Korea, uh, and nations in between. And so, you know, we started as a coffee business in 1952, delved into tea a few years later, and I've stayed in agriculture growing that base over these years. Um, I, I get asked this question around, why are you pushing this so hard now? And, and I find it an easy one to answer because uh, we've always pushed it. Uh, from the inception of this organization, sustainability was at the core of what we do. The difference was in the 50s running up to when this became a mantra for global companies to engulf, it was being pushed by default, uh, not by design. So in other words, being an agricultural business, our profits and what we do for the good of nature and what we do for the prosperity of our stakeholders is dependent on what we do with the land we are given. So our, our being an agricultural business, uh, our, our entity entails making money from land. And so if you don't take care of that, and natural resources, obviously, rain-fed uh, crops to produce food for sustainability of humanity, if you don't do that in a sustainable way, there's no way you're going to last 70 years. So we've been doing this for long. I think what's changed in the last few years is the fact that we are now deliberate about it. Uh, we see a lot of these goals that uh, have come to us through the Sustainable Development Goals in the United Nations Global Compact, both globally and in the Kenyan chapter as low hanging fruits and some of them are obviously ambitious and stretched goals but it was really an easy an easy choice for us uh, the second reason uh, susan is we really don't have a choice if we don't do this now uh we won't talk of sassini in another 70 years and, uh, and here i say sassini figuratively because there are many organizations that uh, you know are engulfing sustainability as a platform for the future and that's out of the realization that you know, this is something we must do. We, we've participated, our generation has participated in damaging the environment more than any other generation since humanity began. And so we must be the ones responsible for trying to reverse that, or at least starting that reversal. And so it, it, it really, we don't really have a choice. And, and, and I guess in saying that, 
um, our arms are twisted in making sure that we can do what we need to do in the next seven, eight years, uh, so that at least we can start to turn the tide on some of these issues. Three, it makes common sense. Uh, in actual sense, you make more money being sustainable. If you run your business in a sustainable manner, uh, it's very easy for you to do things the correct way. You feel better about yourself. You go home knowing I did something good for humanity today, not just for profit. And um, that it, you know, you, you, you're building something that you leave for future generations, not just your children and your children's children, but their children's children too. And so it, it's really important for us that we don't want to be looked at as the generation that came, found a beautiful organization, a beautiful planet, and then messed it up and walked away and left nothing for the rest of uh, us who are going to come uh, uh, behind us. Agriculture really is the backbone of the economy in this country. Uh, we've seen ICT and the financial sector grow very strongly in the last 20 years, but agriculture has remained the backbone of what drives the economy. If I could give you a few statistics, tea contributes about 8% of the GDP, uh, it's just one of the crops we play in, and that's Kenyan tea as a, as, as a whole. And that 8% of the GDP in the export sector uh, brings about 25% of Forex. So, you know, a quarter of the foreign money we earn in this country comes from one crop. And so uh, you're not talking coffee, you're not talking macadamia, you're not talking avocado, you're not talking the horticultural crops and all these other things that uh, Kenya is very good at. And that comes from the platform of being very blessed with good terroir, good soils, good climate, uh, a good working ethic in terms of labor that allows us to do these things, a competitive uh, ability to access global markets, uh, central positioning in those global markets so that you know, logistically we can access them. Uh, and so we are very blessed. If we don't take the, uh, in the steps we need to do uh, to, to protect this agricultural sector, it will start fizzling away from being a backbone of the economy. I don't think we can afford that. And so it is very important for us uh, you know, to, to be at the forefront of, this, of sustainability. But, but more importantly, being sustainable accentuates your profits. So um, we are a profitable business. We, we don't miss words about that. We are in this to make money uh, and not just for ourselves, but the communities that we work with as well in our models of agriculture and not just for now and for the next 10 years, but for eternity. Um, and so we, we, over the 70 years, have discovered that when you do things the correct way, they're easier to do and they give you more. And so why not? And so when we were reviewing our strategic framework a couple of years back, we made this the core of what uh, the basis of those frameworks were going to be uh, and, and something that we're going to take seriously uh, going forward. It drives skill upliftment, it drives gender equity, it drives protection of the environment, it drives all the good things that businesses talk about that we can now put pen to paper and go beyond pen to paper by actioning them. And so it's very easy for us to, to, to get onto this. And, and for me, it's very easy to defend. Thanks, Susan. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think you're so right, um, you know, particularly looking at your agriculture sector, you know, not only in terms of GDP, but also the fact that it employs, you know, it's the largest employer in, in the country. So your role in the agricultural sector when it comes to manufacturing is also really critical in terms of, of livelihood. So thank you for, for championing um, the sustainability agenda as you do with your organization. Um, Rebecca, let me come to you um, because I think whenever we're having the sustainability conversation, um, a lot of organizations can say, oh, this is, this is great. It's a, it's a nice to do, but it's not the main thing for us to do. And I think particularly with the time that we have gone through with COVID and the economic downturn that we're in and is likely to continue, um, a lot of companies and even those that are really uh, driving their agenda forward and you know, aspiring to be more responsible and sustainable companies have felt that they've had to question um, you know, the balance sheet versus their sustainability commitment. Um, so from your perspective as uh, the CEO of Family Bank, what steps have you taken to balance your short-term financial needs of your company with your long-term sustainability commitment? All right, thank you very much, Susan, uh, Cam for and Global Compact for organizing this forum. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to your members and members of the public here present. Uh, and yes, you do ask a very pertinent question. I think uh, with the pandemic, 
this has brought to fore actually what sustainability is all about. So sustainability as a last year became a real life issue. I know a lot of us have very good broad statements and policies around uh, building sustainable practices and sustainable businesses accompanied by very good sustainability policies. Uh, but what happened then with the onset of the pandemic, uh, because the pandemic was perhaps one of the, uh, the single most uh, global challenge the world has encountered in quite a number of years. I think people speak around 100 years where we've not had uh, mag uh, an impact of uh, such magnitude, uh, where you've seen such a huge uh, geographical spread, where you have high rates of uh, in, in, sorry, uh, in, um, infection, you've seen disruption, you've seen global supply chain, financial market disrupted. So this really for a bank, and I'm talking about family bank, was something that was directly affecting where you carry out your business. Because of course, all the commercial banks we have here operate in a society that was now going to be affected. And of course, the nature of our business is we are providing credit in a market. We are providing transactional banking in, a, in an environment that is now affected. And just uh, even uh, we ourselves, the staff, uh, the people find ourselves in that environment. Uh, so what uh, came to fore, and uh, this is quite interesting, is that uh, you totally really had to first and foremost uh, like everyone else, first prioritize uh, the crisis, understanding it, and balance sheets took a secondary approach. Uh, and why a secondary approach is because this was the time to really talk about sustainability in terms of just making sure you start to build goodwill. And when I talked about the things that were affected, so you've got businesses affected, a lot of the CAM members are affected, how is it that you, because you're in this environment, are you, as you, are you as a bank and an industry going to be blind to the fact that the realities on the ground are that uh, there is a, a limitation to what people can be able to do in terms of servicing existing facilities? Are you going to be blind that people's supply chains have been adversely affected? that there are people who actually, because now the supply chains have been affected, there are opportunities in the market. The country needs to get self-sufficient in terms of uh, food production, manufacturing. So this is where we were able to come in with Family Bank and the industry to look at how we then support society because basically sustainability is making sure that you're managing the effects of your business on society and the environment. So the society and what we did as an industry, and this is from the economic data that is coming in from Central Bank, is that banks in Kenya are able to actually channel around 2.81 trillion, uh, which is the approximately uh, USD 25 uh, million US, billion USD to private sector, just to be able to support them. And out of this, we saw uh, around 14.5% uh, being allocated uh, to the to to the manufacturing sector. So as uh, the industry also we took an industry approach and Family Bank really was one of the banks that keenly participated on this. Uh, we took a backseat on balance sheets by agreeing then to restructure facilities for people who are struggling. Uh, for us, we saw around uh, we restructured around twenty five percent of our loan book. Uh, we also uh, saw all the other banks take a similar approach. There was a concern around that cash was one of the potential super spreaders for the disease. So we were all able to go cashless, support government in the initiatives to go cashless. And even getting more uh, uh, to the society uh, and what the impact was on COVID. We saw an initiative around making sure that the country was COVID ready. And uh, Susan, what we were able to do is uh, notice that uh, a lot of the counties, a lot of the government entities who are our business partners called upon us and told us that uh, we might not be as COVID ready as we might want. Some of us don't have ventilators in our hospital beds. 
So I remember Family Bank, we actually last year went on an initiative where we're almost able to support 10 counties in terms of their COVID preparedness. So I would say in a nutshell, really everybody had to step out of just a keen eye on the balance sheet and be able to see then how you support uh, the society that you are in, that you're a party to, to be able to just cope with this uh, pandemic. And also for those who, uh, and, and, and I'm grateful that uh, through the support we also gave to some of the industries, the manufacturing sector, we've seen the industry start to pick up. Uh, we, we are seeing some of uh, the, 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 as the, the companies we support, uh, family, then uh, getting supply chains that are local. So I think we are proud of having then uh, slightly set aside the balance sheet to support the society. Thanks, thanks, Rebecca. I think you, you touch on a really important point um, that uh, based on some research I saw earlier this year by Edelman Trust on their trust barometer, um, through the, I think through the pandemic and the way uh, the private sector responded and manufacturing responded and how they flipped things around, um, Kenyans are actually trusting business or the private sector more um, than they did um, government and media. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's a, a testament to how, like you say, with Family Bank um, and the private sector being able to move from just thinking about the balance sheet and really looking at what is the, the societal need and value. And, and like you say, that's also what builds your your relationship and your loyalty for the long term um, with your customers. So thanks for that feedback. Um, Flora, allow me to come to you, um, particularly uh, in your new role as the, the chair of KEPSA, the private sector alliance uh, for Kenya. How do you see um, your role and the role of the private sector in delivering sustainable development for Kenya? All right, thank you very much. And um, thanks for the congratulatory messages, um, message. Basically, as we know, you know, the private sector is the engine for growth in any economy. So successful businesses drive growth. They'll create the jobs, they'll pay the taxes and then finance the services and the investment. So in developing countries, the private sector gen generally generates 90% of employment and funds 60% of all investments and provides more than 80% of government revenues. Well, so therefore, for this reason, KEPSA has a clear path to support the private sector in, in tackling trade barriers. And this is what we commonly hear people calling creating an enabling environment. So looking at the SDGs, you will notice it fits within the country's plans uh, where we have, um, you know, we have education, access to water, access to health, you know, um, consumption and partnership, you know, just to mention a few. And if you compare that to the Big Four Agenda or the uh, Vision 2030, you'll notice that they do tend to address um, in all of these um, the SDGs. For example, for us at KEPSA, one of our, our, our main pillars of our five is sustainability from, you know, from the oceans to green, to, um, you know, promoting in manufacturing, promoting it in business. So as, as, as um, I think it's, it's, it's already there, it's mainstreamed, it's, it's, it's well understood. And as the country relies on the private sector to realize economic growth, you know, um, especially through production, basically you, you, will, you, you will see that, um, you know, be, um, well, it is there, it is manifesting itself. We have programs, we even are, are um, we are the ones who help report on, on the SDGs um, as, they, as, as they do basically happen. So um, we're basically also seeing an increased interest of businesses to align their strategies to the SDGs and also to the government agenda. We are seeing government take it up and um, you know, we, we do try to hold government accountable. And so every so often we are having um, these conversations where we are asking them, you know, how far have we got, what else can we do? So I, I would say uh, private sector is well on its way, um, whether, whether we, are, we are quick enough is another conversation. But generally, um, this is being the engine for growth. This is where it is all going to happen. 
um, it, I, I, um, the Lady of Family Bank was just talking about um, what, what they have done for financing. Like um, we are members of ICC at KEPSA and I was on a committee, a global committee looking at, uh, looking at reimagining for SMEs um, whether the financial sector is uh, favorable to SMEs. And of course, we had a study done uh, globally, by the way, or, uh, in the Asia and in, in Africa. And in Africa, fortunately, we only the, it was only Kenya and Ghana that actually managed to get into this research. And of course, one of the things they found is that um, the whole framework does not support SMEs. And yes, SMEs are the engine for growth. So these are the kind of places where we are placed to sort of be able to bring home and, 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 and change it. And um, right in the next few, we'll be seeing that whole reimagining being changed. They're going to change how banks talk to each other, how banks wire money, and how money basically circulates within within the global economy and how and how accessible it is. And that's just to mention just one of them. So um, I think private sector is very, very aware. They understand, and we all know the benefits, like had been mentioned by Martin earlier, of sustainability. Green, we all know green, how important green has become, how important blue has become. And we, we, we have um, programs that really help to support this. So I would say we're well on our way. Uh, it is well understood. The financing of it is now what we are trying to relook to, to look at um, because the will is there. Great. Thank you. Um, I think you raised uh, yeah, very pertinent points. So it's it's really not new that the private sector is actually uh, driving change because I think that's a positive thing, you know. A lot of the 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 transformation that has happened for us as a country has been because the private sector has taken the lead. So we wish you success in uh, championing that, continuing to champion that for our private sector to really mainstream uh, sustainable development as part of their agenda. Um, I'd now like to go to Judy. Judy, you're the uh, executive director of Global Compact Network Kenya. Uh, and the Global Compact is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative uh, in the world. What support are you giving to companies um, in terms of their sustainability journey and particularly as the network in Kenya? Yeah, thank you, Susan. And uh, thank you also to Phyllis and the panelists uh, for you know, coming forward to have this very important discussion, which I think we will be building on. Uh, as the months roll by. So we look forward to engaging the manufacturing sector to really inspire ambition, uh, to really embrace uh, sustainability, but to also help us close the gaps around the sustainable development goals within the next 10 years. Now, Susan, um, allow me to just reflect where we are at within Africa. We know we are the fastest growing economy in the region um, in terms of population but also in terms of uh, economic growth. But despite this growth, um, we continue to see high levels of poverty and rising inequalities. And what this tells us is that even though there's growth, it's not inclusive, neither is it sustainable. And at the same time, we have uh, a lot of growing expectations from citizens, from governments, from communities and from investors that business must play an important role in driving sustainable development. And I think we've heard very well from Rebecca how the private sector also had to step up in helping provide some of the solutions to the pandemic. So as you alluded to earlier, um, looking at the trust levels within the society and the ecosystem in which business uh, operates, there's growing expectation that business is best placed to provide some of the solutions to the, the challenges as they are presented by the sustainable development goals. And I think even as Martin reflected, it's really in the self-interest of business to take these issues into account, even as you pursue you know, the goals around um, ensuring that your balance sheet is, is strong. And so the Global Compact essentially was formed in the year 2000 to unite businesses everywhere to be a force for good and to put a human face back to the global market. And so as the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative, we exist to really support businesses that are interested in mainstreaming sustainability 
and for businesses that understand their role within society, that they need to be able to be a partner in the development process together with, with governments. And we do this by ensuring that we provide you with a universally accepted framework of what corporate sustainability is all about. So the Global Compact um, is very critical within the UN system in helping us uh, formulate a corporate or a common language of what corporate sustainability is. And that is what we offer to the private sector. We are very excited that uh, CAM has provided um, you know, the hosting uh, facility for the Kenyan network uh, for the last couple of years. And it is our intention going forward that we will engage the manufacturing sector more closely and more strongly to be able to embrace this principle-based approach to, to sustainability, which is so critical because it accounts for the most fundamental responsibilities uh, for any corporate entity that is out there that wants to say and that wants to, you know, firmly, you know, demonstrate that they are committed to responsible business conduct. And so our 10 principles, which are around the key focus areas of human rights, the environment, labor, and anti-corruption provide for all businesses in Kenya, regardless of the sector, the universal language of what corporate sustainability is all about. And that's why we are so excited about it. And uh, more importantly, in this decade of action, we are also supporting companies to not just take action in support of the SDGs, but to take ambitious action. And Susan, I think if the pandemic is anything to go by, we see there are real risks within our global economy that if we don't take um, the SDGs into account in how we are responding to uh, the societal challenges, then for sure, we also compromise the abilities of our own business to be able to, you know, to prosper into the future. And so we are working very closely, especially in this, you know, last uh, nine years of the SDGs to help business to understand more concretely what the SDGs are all about and how to take concrete action. And so we are doing this by offering uh, support around key, uh, you know, issue areas of capacity building. Uh, where companies that are members of the Global Compact are able to access best-in-class trainings, you know, expertise um, across the different thematic areas of, of, the, of sustainability, but they also have access to guidance and tools, tools that help you understand how to take action from a business perspective. Of course, appreciating that um, the development agenda might be seen as a new agenda for the private sector. It requires a different language and a different way of, of looking at um, how to merge the two, the two agendas. And so we help businesses to unpack this practically and take action. Um, critically, we are very excited that we have um, an academy on board. And this is a learning platform that is available to all companies um, and all employees of, of these companies to be able to, of course, upskill across the different sustainability topics, whether you're thinking about sustainable manufacturing, uh, whether you're thinking about the circular economy, whether you're you know, interested in issues of gender, across the board, across the environment, social and governance pillars of the, uh, of the sustainability agenda, your staff and um, of course all the companies within uh, the network can be able to access this. And I think more critically, even as we challenge ourselves to be more ambitious in this uh, sustainability journey, uh, at the Global Compact we offer you know, business is a platform to be able to showcase uh, their sustainability progress, but also, in, uh, you know, their ambition. So we have a global platform where we have close to um, 20,000 companies and growing where Kenyan companies, we are also asking them to tell their stories on the world stage on how we are also advancing uh, this agenda. And I think it's, it's, it's really critical, especially when we are also trying to de-risk, you know, the business ecosystem within Kenya. And I think these are the questions that investors are asking if at all, you know, they would be interested in plugging in. Um, I think I would also say that, you know, we are partners to the business community um, who want to progress in their sustainability journey, um, regardless of where you are whether you're just starting out or whether you're really experienced and you're looking to stretch further, we work with you and we also provide you with a platform where you can come to learn uh, alongside other Kenyan companies at the regional level as well as the global level. And I think, uh, Susan, if I can just mention the last thing, I think 
one of the most critical things uh, that the Global Compact and even the existing members tell us is that um, we are giving them a platform where they can be able to demonstrate their commitments to society. And these commitments, you know, uh, also to their investors, to the communities uh, where they have their operations and also to their employees. And this is really strengthening, you know, the business case as to why companies must embrace this particular agenda. And so just to make a, a very strong call to all the manufacturers uh, and other companies that are on the call, the Global Compact uh, Network Kenya that is hosted at CAM is available, um, you know, to you to plug in, to be able to start and to move faster in your journey. And so we, we call on you to, to reach out to the Kenya network after this call to understand how you can plug in and how we can be able to also tell your stories uh, to a global uh, as well as a, a, a regional audience. Thank you, Susan. Judy, thanks for that. Um, I think the point that you raised you know, um, about the network, which, which really hits home for me is the fact that there's uh, a platform where business can learn and exchange from each other. You know, a lot of times uh, companies or organizations can, can feel like you're on this journey by yourself, that you're really trying to figure out how to do things, but that's also part of the, the great value of, of the network. You have, uh, you know, big companies like Family Bank and Sassini, um, who are already far on on the journey, who can help you. But then you also have a smaller organization. So you're really not on your own and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's good practice out there that can come through part of being the membership of the Global Compact Network. Um, yeah, let me just uh, look quickly at the chats. There's a great recommendation um, from Sujit who's in the audience that says um, everyone should watch the documentary Breaking Boundaries on Netflix. It may give impetus to CAM members to look at sustainability as a way of operating. So we're heading into the weekend. If you're not sure what weekend viewing you're gonna have, there's a recommendation from Sujit. Thank you for that. Um, we also have some questions uh, that have come through from Dennis and Juanita. Um, Martin, there's a question here for you specifically for Sassini. So maybe if you have a moment, you could um, uh, just take the time to respond in the, in the live chat. Um, and then maybe what I'll do now is just um, come to you, Rebecca, because I think there's some interesting points that were raised also when Flora was talking about uh, the role of finance and financing around the, the SDG agenda. Um, the financial sector will have a very critical role to play um, in terms of financing and how money will drive where things will happen. Um, looking at the global compact and the 10 principles and also the SDGs themselves, which are 17, there are a lot of themes that are brought out that are key themes um, and key priority areas that you know, all industries should be looking at. From your perspective as a financial institution, what do you see as things coming out um, from a sustainable investment perspective? Where will the money potentially be going in the future? All right, thank you very much, Susan. So just to admit that I must be one of the new kids on the block in terms of membership to Global Compact Network. And perhaps one of the reasons why Family Bank joined is that we realized we have been walking the journey far back as uh, six years ago, started with reporting, then we realized that we'd embedded it uh, in our strategic plan. We were actually walking the sustainability journey. And while we realized that this was something that was already with us, uh, we'll also help you address the question you've posed, is that uh, Family Bank started 37 years ago, and it's one of the local commercial banks that uh, believed in then uh, just making sure we have financial inclusion in Kenya. We started as simple as uh, with the tea farmers. Uh, over the years have supported a lot of people, the youth, the women, uh, the small business people, to a point where if you look at where Family Bank sits, we are supporting around 60% uh, of our loan book to the SMEs. And we all know that the SMEs are contributing significantly to the employment in this country, to the GDP of this country. And I think the statistics are almost at uh, 33, 
to 40% contribution to the GDP. Uh, so when you look at that uh, whole aspect of financial inclusion, and a lot of these SMEs we support uh, as, uh, are really an integral part of the supply chain for the manufacturers we have here on board. Uh, some of the manufacturers here still are enterprises within themselves that are SMEs. Uh, so the key thing where we have seen that we would definitely need to focus on is just making sure we catalyze wealth creation within the country. And when we talk about catalyzing wealth creation and building uh, an inclusive society, then you start to talk about human rights. You, talk to, you start to talk about labor, because then you're talking about being able to create or employment opportunities because every SME you finance, uh, SMEs are basically contributing to around 80% of our employment in Kenya. And then when you're supporting these organizations also, you're able then um, in your own way then to be able to contribute to the other aspects uh, in terms of the environment because some of the conditions that you have embedded within your lending practices uh, required then uh, that uh, there's uh, sustainable environmental issues so that we do not have environmental degradation. We are using environmentally safe technologies. And then you have the general conduct of business, which then abhors extortion or bribery. So for me, I think that's the greatest way that we as a family bank will be able to then to contribute to this by catalyzing wealth creation. And the areas that we really have seen that will be important uh, going forward, because re this really must talk to the society, is on around simple issues, simple issues like water, waste management. Uh, I recall some years back in 2019, we launched a whole department, a whole product around water and waste management, which we know then is quite uh, important in any society. Uh, we've been able to work with a lot of waste management companies, water companies, just to be able to ensure that uh, the water sector really is funded so that, uh, the, that we have environmentally sensitive ways of have, harvesting water, retaining and conserving water, as well as waste management. The other one that we've seen that will be important going forward is, of course, education. Education, very important in terms of overly over the years coming towards transforming the society that we operate in. Uh, obviously, as a bank, this is a sector you're quite happy to finance education. We also have through our foundation a lot of initiatives just to be able to support uh, needy children. We've got uh, also programs around children with disability. Uh, the big one is on health, and this came to fore a lot last year um, in terms of what we needed as a country to just make sure we are building on our health care systems. Perhaps the reason why the country has been able to cope uh, slightly better than our counterparts globally is the initiatives that were just taken to make sure that uh, we are allowing universal health access. We can see this uh, bearing fruit. Uh, and also the keen interest in making sure that there's, there's access around the country. I did mention earlier just getting COVID ready. So as an industry also making sure, and we realized actually in 2019, last year, that it's an industry that basically has been underfunded. And we've been able to then have partners that are able to work with us just to make sure that we are supporting uh, the health industry. Because I think what everybody agrees currently, uh, the first thing you wake up in the morning is to thank God that you're in good health. So health has become the single most important item and if not managed well, then we've seen the kind of crisis that it can portend for the world. And the other areas is then uh, technology and uh, climate change. I think technology also has come to fall. All banks have really, and, and I think not even banks, if you look at what we are doing today, this has been as a result of technology. Technology is going to be then a game changer. Technology has started to reduce then the, perhaps the footprint, the carbon emissions, 
perhaps we don't have been uh, required to travel to come to a central place we are having these meetings. And these are areas also we continue to support uh, both as family bank innovation, how do we make sure that we are continuously innovating around making, uh, uh, ensuring that we are supporting technology, we are utilizing technology for efficiencies, uh, for making things convenient. I think uh, going forward, convenience is everything uh, for, 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 for the industry. And then obviously the big issue around uh, environmental conservation. So I would like to say that uh, as, as a bank, we've realized that uh, on the back of COVID then the great focus will be just building back uh, for better. So we want to say that we will take the lessons we were gathered uh, during this period to be, some, to be able to support the country at large, come at large, all our customers, the SMEs, so we can be able to build a more just, equitable and resilient society. When you have a financially empowered society, it's then definitely a society that is able to uh, be sustainable. And I just want to uh, end with some remarks that were made by uh, last week, I think by the UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres, he said, as we consider a post COVID-19 future, there are two crossroads be, uh, before us. One road leads us to business as usual and an uncertain fate for people and the planet. The other road leads us to a more inclusive green recovery. So let's choose wisely and move forward united in ambition and collective action for a world where no one is left behind. So just to sum up, I don't think that everybody, anybody will want to go to business as usual uh, because of the trust we've created. I think it's imperative as all the stakeholders represented here today that we make sure that we are moving forward in a more inclusive manner so that we can be able to have a, a recovery overall. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was very uh, deep and insightful. So I think the, the points that have hit home for me is for sure uh, climate change um, is, is, is a key area. Health, technology, um, and then tying to the point that Flora had made earlier, I believe, around SMEs um, was the financial inclusion aspect. And that really now as uh, the financing uh, sector looks to give its money or to give credit, ESG or environmental, social and governance risks are going to take a much stronger um, focus in you determining whether you're giving, giving money or not, if I could put it that way. So thank you, for the, thank you very much uh, for those insights. Flora, if I could come to you. Um, of course, you're now in your new role as uh, the, the chair of KEPSA, but before that, you had the hat as the chair of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And as we can see from the discussions we've been having this morning, there has been some work, and as, Flor um, sorry, as Phyllis highlighted in her opening remarks, there's some work that the manufacturing sector has been doing around um, mainstreaming sustainability. Are there some good practice examples that you have seen from the manufacturing sector? And how can those be better scaled uh, for Kenya? All right, um, thank you very much. First, let me say the private sector enthusiasm for the SDGs is strong, growing, but translating interest to action has really, really been challenging. You know, the uptake is much slower than expected. And actually, if I must say, a little worrying if we're expected to meet our 2030 um, goals. And that is why for, for, the, the, for us at the Global Compact, we said this is the year for action. This is the year that we really must see change. And so therefore, um, engagement, and, and I must say engagement strategies for a lot of us are still, and including in the manufacturing sector, are still in the infancy um, and um, stages and very really from business to business. The biggest challenge and therefore the biggest opportunity I say um, companies need um, need to do, first of all, is to choose. You know, in, when you're asking me about best practices, I think is to choose the, uh, some SDGs. You know how they say you can be um, a, 
we take all and a master of none. I can't quite remember the phrase, but they're 17. Let's be fair. Um, a lot of companies are either SMEs and even if they are large, and we do know the larger companies, but can we concentrate on all, all, all 17? My suggestion and what I've seen and in the people who really perfect it is choose a few to focus on five, six, seven, whatever you're comfortable with or wherever you, you play. The second best practice I would also say is align, uh, align this strategy and um, to your targets. Have specific SDG targets, set a criteria, measure the contributions to the ones that you have chosen. So let, um, whatever you choose, whether it's gender mainstreaming, whether it's um, whether it's in the environment, whether it's a human right um, 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 SDG, put in, understand what the targets are, put in targets for your company and actually aim to that. Set ambitious, make them ambitious, please. Please, um, we're, like, like um, she said, the quote about Guterres, it's not gonna be business as usual. Really, let's have it ambitious so that we can actually get to where we are going. Ambitious enough to really make a difference. Defining what success will look like and creating also an m and &E criteria. So to your question around what I have seen the manufacturers do, I think um, I've seen a lot of them um, choose a selected few. I've seen a lot of them now starting to say, these are the ones I'm going to focus on. Um, I'll tell you one that is very close to my heart, which is, um, it was around the gender, gender SDG, where we started with Phyllis, the CEO, uh, Women in Manufacturing Program. The idea was to actually bring out, um, help women sort of absorb, you know, sort of be comfortable in this manufacturing space, which is really very male, male dominated. Uh, the program I think now is about four or five years old and definitely way past its infancy. And we're starting to see because women, a lot of women manufacture. Incidentally, if you look around, you know, somebody will say, I knit, I knit, I do honey, I do this on the side, I, but they don't scale up. And so the idea was to help them sort of scale up. We've also seen um, people, um, we've observed some of our members introduce alternative products that reduce degradation on the environment. An example being packaging material, a lot of people have moved towards the recycling. You know, um, we, we've seen a recyclers coming up and people just saying, I've changed my packaging and, and this is what I'm gonna do. And the interesting thing is some might be even more expensive, but we've seen the uptake, especially during um, the COVID period, um, really increase. And we refer this to this as waste to value concept, a direct contribution to the sustainable production. Yesterday, I was on a call with um, uh, about vaccines and one medical hospital, actually, I think it was the Aga Khan, was saying now, because, you know, in the whole idea of uh, recycling, they were, they were crushing their vials, you know, the vials after you've given the vaccine. And we were like, wow, how responsible is that? And the other hospitals joined in and said, can you share how you actually do this? You know, um, gender equality is a small thing. It's, it's something we can celebrate. We've definitely seen uh, women in boards increasing, women in leadership increasing, top leadership, for example, myself. So board diversity is something we can definitely celebrate. Companies are becoming more and more intentional in inviting women to be part of the board and based on their skills and really not just a tick box. So these are areas we've seen manufacturers um, being able to pick up. I know the water conversation is a very, very big conversation that um, companies have picked up. Labor, you know, labor rights of, of, of whatever. Last year, of course, during COVID, I do know a lot of companies in the manufacturing sector who said, business-wise, it would make sense to sort of um, lay off, but this is not the right time to do it. And they carried them onto, on, on, onto their PNL, just out of, uh, you know, perhaps on a human right uh, basis. So finally, what I would say is companies are beginning to listen. Um, um, what would I say? SDG uptake is definitely increasing. Like Judy said, um, the, the, the Global Compact does give a brilliant platform for us to go, go back and really task them or help ask, ask for help, for them to help us listen to the experts, listen to all the knowledge base that they have in order to take care of the environment and increase the biodiversity and reduce carbon footprint. So I would say manufacturing is one of the, the, the sectors in this industry that has really taken the lead and I'd like to encourage them to do more. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Flora. Um, that was really, really insightful. Um, 
we are on the journey, I think, as private sector and as particularly manufacturing, but there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, I'm seeing some comments coming through um, with a lot of appreciation for the conversation that we're having with yourselves as the panelists and the fact that you're representing the manufacturing sector. But someone's asking, what about other sectors? What more can we do? And, and just to you, the audience to know, this is the first of many CEO forums like um, Phyllis mentioned in her remarks. This first one is centered around the manufacturing sector uh, because it's also hosted by Kenya Association of Manufacturers. But Global Compact Network also works across multiple sectors. So this is particularly looking at this particular industry, but take heart. We see your enthusiasm then for sustainability to be embedded across all sectors. Um, and there's another comment here that asks, what about uh, the public sector? Um, and Judy, maybe you can touch on this um, when you cover off uh, for us, uh, or maybe also responding in the chat, how the how Global Compact also works with government or public sector to drive this agenda, especially from a policy and, a, and legal framework. Um, so I'll continue and maybe come to you, Martin. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of um, people in the audience who know about Global Compact, but actually haven't taken the steps to become a member. So as the senior, why did you sign up uh, for the Global Compact? And has it really, 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 truly added value for your business and, in, and your organization? Yeah, th thanks, Susan. Um, we, we've been members for some years now, and, and we've seen the effect of the UN Global Compact uh, in the ambitious goals set, uh, not just in Kenya, but globally. Uh, but to answer you directly, just the utter size of what that initiative drives globally is big enough for, for us to tap into. Um, if you look at, I think it was Flora and Judy who are talking about the 17 SDGs, let's be honest, there's no organization in the world that I know of, and some of us have been lucky enough to be exposed globally in working in different continents driving these uh, initiatives that can do all those 17 things. It's almost utterly impossible. They each need funding, they each need a commitment right from board to strategy level to implementation level over a long period of time. And so the more you fund those initiatives, the less money you put onto your uh, p &L in terms of income that you generate for your stakeholders. So you've got to be clever, but you can't also do nothing because then you're just contributing to degradation and leaving the world the worst place that we found it. So for us, the size of that initiative is, is really one of the easiest tuning points to come into why uh, we want to be uh, you know, in this ambition. Also, it's a global movement. So the impact is going to be global. You know, why place more? If you want to do something big, join the guys who are intended on giving big results. We don't see a bigger initiative than the UN Global Compact. And so it's really imperative on us that uh, you know, we tie ourselves to this and, uh, and, and help to drive a set of goals that are unified. So we are not driving East when the world is driving West. And that's one of the things that, uh, that we chose to align ourselves with this. Also, everybody talks about SDGs. Yes, they're 17. This came from the Millennium Development Goals. I think those were 10 or 12 whenever we were working on them earlier in the millennium. Um, I don't know how many people can recite those 17, but the, the, those goals encompass every aspect of sustainability in my humble view. And so if you're an organization looking to make an impact in sustainability, why reinvent the wheel? Look for guys who've already done the work, uh, guys who've given you the set of goals that you can then say, here, let me work with these goals. And, and I see some comments whenever we have these uh, discussions around, you know, corporates make uh, easy choices. They go and cherry pick which of these goals to work with um, uh, because those goals are easy for them to achieve. Yes, there are corporates who do that. Uh, and I would say those corporates are doing 10 times more than corporates that are not cherry picking. Uh, and so even if you're cherry picking, you're doing a lot of work there. But if you are familiar with the UNGC work, there's a lot of tools that help corporates through a series of questionnaires, a series of activities through uh, the action manager, which is a program they've got that helps you to then input what your organization is currently at, at a stage, 
that spins out what that program thinks you should focus on as an organization. So it's not really cherry picking because what that then avoids you uh, doing is choosing the easy goals that you're going to meet easily, uh, where you can make uh, you know a bigger impact in other areas which the program would spin out for you. And so you know th that that really was another driver for us um, to say this is a program we want to work with. Fourthly, you know I don't know of a global initiative that is driving a goal this singular that has so many like-minded uh, companies. Uh, I want to hear from China what the biggest agricultural industry or company is doing about sustainability there, because then just maybe, just maybe we can do the same here to, to achieve a bigger result. I want to hear from Brazil what the big coffee growers are doing there. And so what better place than the UN Global Compact, because they're all there, all the global, it's a global initiative, it's centered under the principles of the United Nations, and so it just makes sense um, that, that we are part of it. They have these tools that Judy is talking about. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to enumerate all of them, but uh, it really is a very, very strong resource center uh, to go and get what you would like to do as a starting organization to drive sustainability. Uh, let me also say this, Susan. I doubt that there's any business, small, medium, or corporate like ourselves, that isn't doing some aspect of a sustainable practice in their business. Maybe they just don't know it. But there is sustainability in business by virtue of the way business works. And so if you are looking to just enhance that small thing that you're doing, there's no better place than the UNGC to do that. There's the idea of sharing of practice. We, we, we feel that we can compare ourselves to peers, not just in the agricultural industry, but also in other sectors. So what's happening in, in banking where Rebecca is and what's happening in manufacturing uh, with Phyllis where we also are, what's happening in ICT where organizations like Safaricom are, and are there synergies and best practices that can be transferred across these industries uh, to help those in agriculture, you know, implement some of them to the benefit of the, not just the organization, but, but the world at large. And that sharing of uh, best practice is really a big point for us as well. Ability to be, you know, held accountable. There's one thing in the UNGC program where you know, you set your goals, you make them public, you declare them, you make your sustainability statement, you start working towards them, then you measure them. And every year you do your sustainability report, which then says, you know, this is the detail of my reporting in terms of progress and what we're doing in this organization. So you're accountable, not just to yourselves and to your board or to your organization or to your owner, if you're a small enterprise, but to the public, because you're committing to yourselves that you want to be part of the solution uh, rather than complaining about, oh, government should do this and big private sector should do that. So I, I think that, um, you know, for me, it's been very obvious. And then to answer the second part of your question, uh, has it really worked for us? I, I think if you look at what we are doing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what the action manager chose for us and what we agreed to then uh, pursue, uh, we couldn't be happier. Just allow me very quickly in less than a minute to just, just highlight for you the nine goals we work with. So we have a strong drive towards um, um, driving against poverty, you know, the whole aspect of trying to make the world better through the work that Sassini does. Uh, there are several programs we drive there uh, that I'm very proud of uh, and, and that are helping us and starting to give us results in achieving the things that we want to do there. Uh, good health and well-being. Um, our facilities, we are, a, we are a big organization where our plantations are littered from the west of the Rift Valley in the tree growing areas, the central islands for coffee, uh, macadamia and avocado uh, to the coast for trading. Uh, and our organization setup is littered with good healthcare facilities for all our employees, and in some cases for the general public as well. Something we are very proud of. We are, we are very strong in driving quality education. We have our own schools, uh, which not only accommodate you know, people who work for us, but people who are in our communities as well. Um, two years ago, our leadership uh, composition had about 12% uh, of uh, you know, top leaders being female. Today, that has risen in two years to 40%. That's because we're deliberate about those goals. We want to get there by doing it, not just talking about it. Affordable and clean energy. We are a huge consumer of uh, Kenya power in terms of hydroelectric power because we run our tea factories 24 seven, macadamia avocado, uh, pack house and the coffee mills as well. And that consumes a lot of money in terms of expenses that goes into running those machines. Uh, we know what hydropower does into to the environment. So our commitment 
uh, to look at clean energy has yielded a project where we are now about to actually launch a uh, replacement of up to 30% of our power needs uh, from renewable energy uh, in our tea business. Once that's successful, we roll that uh, to the rest of our business. Uh, we want to contribute to decent work and economic growth. We don't just want to make profit and then leave the uh, you know, communities that we are in uh, poor. And so you know, part of our success must be shared with those that we touch uh, in the areas where we work. Industry, innovation, infrastructure. I don't know if you know, but um, agriculture is heavily, you know, enamored by human labor in Kenya. Uh, it's part of the reason the general cost of producing agricultural products in this country is very high. And so when the globe went to mechanization in the 80s and the 90s, we sort of like lagged behind. And Sassini has come very strongly in the recent past to say, you know, that's something we can change without necessarily negatively affecting the human beings that are affected by mechanization or automation, but making those businesses more sustainable uh, to last another, you know, 20, 30 uh, decades uh, from now. Uh, and so we want to move with the times. We want to be able that we are at the forefront of uh, that innovation as well. Uh, responsible consumption and production. Um, you know, let's not waste things just because we have it in abundance. Uh, it's a mantra we have in our business uh, for, from simple things, you know, letting taps run when you're not using them uh, to leaving lights on overnight when you go home, you know, that kind of, of stuff that we drive, you know, messaging across the organization very, very strongly. Uh, and so that gives us the results that we want. And then lastly, life on land. We, we, we are an agricultural business. And so, you know, we derive our profits and prosperity from land. And if we don't take care of it, we will not have profits. And so it's very important for us that uh, we, we, you know, dial into this very strongly. And so it's a very easy decision. One, we don't have a choice. And like I said earlier in my discussion, if we don't do this, we are not being responsible enough. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, and thanks for, um, showing how the action manager helped you to yeah hone in the SDGs that you're that you're going to prioritize. There are a couple of questions for you on the QA. If I could ask you just to respond to them. There's one uh, from I think it's from yes John uh, Dungi if you could just uh, get back to him on the chat. Um, we have our second poll running. We would really appreciate your feedback. So please feel free to respond. And uh, Judy, maybe as you come in, you could um, share with us um, what it takes for a company to join uh, the Global Compact. Um, there have been some questions around that. And uh, Juanita, you also had a question around um, the manufacturing sector and the SDGs and the time that we have left to 2030. I hope that Phyllis will cover, up, cover that off while she gives us her the association um, call to action and way forward. Um, so Judy, over to you. What does it, yeah, what does it entail to 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 join the global compact as a company? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, and really, it's simple. Um, the global compact, at its heart, seeks to be a very inclusive organization where we attract the participation of any company that is willing and that is you know, interested um, to advance its business goals alongside sustainability. And so one of the things that we are very um, serious about is that it has to be a leadership commitment. Um, as with other business areas, whether you're driving, you, you know, your targets around marketing, sales, um, sustainability has to be driven at the highest level of the business. And so we call for the CEOs of any, you know, interested company to make the commitment on behalf of the organization because it has to be driven as a strategic imperative and not as an add-on or as philanthropy or something you do at the business after everything else has been done. So that is one thing that we are very clear that we look at it as a business, as a leading, you know, as a, what can I say, uh, as a leadership um, area for the business uh, to advance. And so it calls for any company to just write a simple letter uh, that is addressed to the UN Secretary General and that it basically details uh, that the company is interested in advancing these particular goals and aims uh, within its business uh, strategies and operations. Um, it also calls for accountability 
uh, it's not enough to say that you're interested in advancing these you know, ambitions, but we also hold you to account in terms of ensuring that you plug into the local network to access the learnings, which in turn will help you to mainstream the different action points within your own operations. And so it means also getting in touch at the local level, at the regional level, as well as the global level to learn, but also to challenge yourself in terms of improvement areas. We keep talking about the decade of action, and I think we've already, um, you know, rang the warning bells that we are not on track to achieve the SDGs by the next nine years. And so one of the things that we are really interested in within the next uh, couple of years is to really challenge business to accelerate its actions um, to help us uh, deliver on the SDGs. And we're really happy that we have uh, launched a number of accelerator programs around the climate, uh, the gender, the SDGs as well in their holistic um, you know, framework as well as youth innovation. And we have identified specific goals that we are asking companies that these goals will provide us, um, you know, the impetus to really drive the next level of actions and impact across the other goals. And so for any company that, you know, does get to join the, the global compact at this point in time, we will be onboarding them into these accelerator programs, which essentially are, you know, mini MBAs to get companies to move closer and faster uh, to delivering on the on the SDGs. I think critically also it calls for um, a commitment to transparency. So there's a growing demand within the business ecosystem that business must account for its impacts to society, to its investors, to different stakeholder groups. And so at the Global Compact, we do give you the framework to communicate uh, what your sustainability commitments are. And we offer you, you know, a universally accepted framework to do this. And so any stakeholder that's out there uh, in the global community that's interested to know what Sassini, what Family Bank or what Melvin Marsh is doing, they're able to use this common platform to understand what the company is, is up to. And we've seen different investors, different stakeholders who are interested um, and interrogating the information that uh, is in these reports to be able to advance, you know, different dialogues with companies uh, across, you know, potential areas of financing and others. Uh, and I think critically for Kenya right now, and looking at the uh, regulatory environment, um, I think listed companies will now be required to report and to make disclosures around their sustainability. Um, so at the Global Compact, the companies that have already been doing this because it's a requirement uh, to participate that you have to communicate progress, they are already in good standing. So you don't have to start grappling with and trying to figure out now where do we begin? Now it's a regulatory compliance, compliance issue. So in effect, we help you to preempt some of the key things that are coming from you know, different um, you know, platforms, whether from regulations, from investors, we help you to meet these growing demands um, early enough. And you're able to, of course, even move beyond a compliance sort of like based uh, engagement, but to look at the SDGs as real opportunities for your business to, to advance. And so I think Suzanne will be able to share um, after this call with all the, the participants, just the basic guidelines on how to, to fill in the application and how to plug in. Uh, but more importantly, we are keen on working the journey with each and every company uh, that has yet to embark on this and using, of course, this universally accepted uh, framework. Thank you, Susan. Judy, thanks for that. Um... My colleague uh, Sheila has also posted in the chat just the, the website for Global Compact. So if anybody wants to have a look and the email as well, um, we're going to say thank you so much to our panelists. Please don't leave us just yet. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Phyllis to come and give us the, the Association of Manufacturers call to action and way forward uh, based from this call. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks very much. I really want to appreciate all the panelists who have uh, shared with us this morning and also everyone who has stayed through to the very end and for the great turnout. And as our speakers have outlined this morning, the private sector does drive the economy and has a big role to play in this decade of action. Uh, Judy keeps saying we have nine years to go. We need to accelerate um, action 
amongst ourselves and we can achieve the much needed jobs we need within the private sector and also create wealth and opportunities for our people. So we are therefore best placed as private sector, as industry, to drive sustainable development in our country and the world at large as we work together to realize the SDGs. And there is progress, but we can make it much faster. So that's what we want to do. That's why we are starting to have these conversations. And as Global Compact, we want to support your businesses on this corporate sustainability journey on embedding the principle-based approach into your businesses. So we call upon you to come on board. We have shared the contacts, uh, the info at globalcompactkenya.org and the website. If you want to reach out through CAM also, we are happy to connect you with Judy and her team um, so that we can onboard you on this process, on this journey, and uh, also work with you to take advantage of the many programs that have been mentioned that we have put in place. So thank you for joining. And uh, this is a fast conversation for the sector, but I know we'll have others for the manufacturing sector and also others for all the other sectors uh, within the economy. So thank you very much and I wish you all a good day. Thank you so much, uh, Phyllis. I want to um, extend a heartfelt thanks to our panelists for that really uh, deep and frank conversation around uh, mainstreaming sustainability uh, within the manufacturing sector. And of course, Flora, for giving uh, deeper insights as well into the, the future agenda, if I can put it that way, for the, for the private sector. Uh, but most of all, thank you to our guests for joining us today. We really hope that you found this forum engaging. It is the first of many. Um, and we will continue to hold these with you because obviously manufacturing, but importantly, the private sector has such a critical role to play in our country's future. And it's really vital that it's on those principles of people, planet, prosperity, that business takes the approach to how they grow themselves. On behalf of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, the Global Compact Network, and of course our panelists, uh stay well stay principled and we wish you all a very wonderful weekend thank you for being with us today and we will speak with you again soon goodbye thank you and goodbye